Christian Anses. I'm Jerry. I'm having the pleasure to chair this session. Um, let's just wait a few minutes until everyone is coming back from has coming back from Gathertown. Okay, seeing a lot of people, I think we can get started with this track, which is all about system security. Um, now, most of you are already familiar with the tools, um, but just to see that people have actually arrived and are still awake, um, let's try something out quite briefly. Um, at the bottom of your WebEx sessions, you will see the smiley button. Um, so to ensure that everyone knows how this works, um, do you hear me better now? To ensure that everyone knows how this works, um, please, everyone, click that smiley button and give an appropriate reaction to the message that we had in the introductory session, that is, a route is going to space. Yep, that looks like people get the hang of it. Um, just for comparison, um, please let me see the reaction to um, this is all still only running on IPv4. Yep. Okay. Um, and the last reaction that I'd like to see from everyone is a warm round of applause uh, for Jürgen Fitchen, who will be telling us about how to get uh, how to get firmware updates through a very constrained being uh, being low data rate uh, IoT link. Jürgen, please take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I, can you see my screen? Not yet. I hope so. Not yet? Yes, now we can see your screen. It works. Great. Yeah. Well, um, today I want to talk about secure update of IoT devices over low data rate wireless networks. And first of all, I want to give just a quick introduction why we at SSV Software Systems, so the company I'm working for, uh, actually care about this topic. Um, we are creating IoT solutions, uh, including microcontroller-based IoT devices. So that's our contact point to, to Riot OS. And for good reasons, we are convinced that every IoT device must be updatable even if this is hard because of low data rate wireless networks. And so we spent the last years to achieve this goal. What we'll cover in this talk, um, we first want to see why we actually need IO uh, updates for IoT devices. Then I want to state some requirements for an update so it can be called secure. I want to show some implementations that are currently available to Riot users, so available to you. And then I want to show uh, challenges that has to be faced uh, when the devices are connected using low data rate networks. And I show solutions or possible solutions to those challenges. Why do we need updates for IoT devices? So uh, the obvious point, fixing vulnerabilities and bugs, um, because as the name of the devices implies, they are connected to the internet. And yeah, not fixing vulnerabilities is a bad idea because the likelihood to become part of a bot botnet is increasing over a lifetime. Furthermore, you could improve and add features during product lifetime for and you can adjust on-device configurations that has been hard-coded into the firmware. And for the fancy stuff, you can also update uh, models for uh, artificial intelligence like neural networks or stuff like that. Um, requirements for secure updates. So first of all, um, this update must happen atomically. So we must ensure 
that the system is immune to power network loss mid update and doesn't leave uh, the device bricked, so not functioning anymore. We must ensure integrity. So um, every byte that has been created by the developer and compiled in, into the firmware must land into the IoT device without being manipulated or uh, yeah, corrupted by transmission errors. We must ensure purpose. So you must be sure that the update that you're flashing in your device is actually code that can be executed and is not yeah, like a picture of kittens or something like that. And you must uh, prevent replay attacks. So you must be immune to downgrades to older versions because if an attacker finds out that your old version has a vulnerability that can be exploited, he could possibly downgrade first your device and then exploit this vulnerability. Um, if you're using Riot, there are some implementations ready for you to use. First of all, we need a solid foundation and that's the bootloader. And Riot is shipped with Riot Boot. Uh, it's a small but powerful bootloader. Here, a small introduction how it works. So this is your flash layout. At the very first beginning, there's a small bootloader that can select from two firmware slots. So um, you're splitting your flash in half and every slot can hold a firmware. Uh, every slot has a header at the beginning, uh, holding metadata about uh, this, the firmware that's sitting in the slot. First of all, there's a magic number um, that can be used to check if the slot X actually holds a, is, uh, a firmware. Then you have a version number a start address, so a pointer to the first byte of the actual firmware, and it checks some, um, yeah, um, securing all the header. Uh, the bootloader algorithm is also very easy and uh, easy to understand, at least for C programmers. So have a look into this. This is the actual implementation of it. So there's a for loop that iterates over both slots or all available slots. First of all, it fetches the header of the slot that is about to be evaluated. Then it checks if the magic actually um, yeah, is, is present. And if it's not, this if clause is true and continue is called. So we are um, continuing with the next slot and not considering the slot anymore. Uh, if the magic matches, we then check the checksum of the header. So we first calculate the checksum of the header that we fetched and compare with the checksum that's uh, stored in the header. If both are matching, we are looking for the highest version. So first of all, we are checking if the slot to boot variable equals to minus one. So because uh, this variable is initialized with minus one in the first run, this is true. And because that's, that's an or, we are jumping right into this uh, if block. We are storing the version of, the, of uh, slot zero and remembering that we've just looked at slot zero. So slot to boot is set to zero. And then we start over the for loop fetch the next header, check the magic, and so on and so forth. And if slot one, so the header of slot one is larger than the highest seen version, so the version of slot zero, we are overriding both variables and the slot to boot now holds slot one. And as the last step in the bootloader, we just jump right into the slot and the firmware uh, is, is starting. Um, that's basically how the booting process um, works. Now we want to look how to change or exchange one of those headers uh, slots. Um, now we are running in firmware slot zero. So the program counter is somewhere here. 
and we want to install this orange colored uh, slot one update. So first of all, we initialize the update process and at the very first step, we are erasing the first flash page that holds slot one header and thus we are clearing the magic. So basically we are making this slot one invalid. Then we copy over uh, the orange bytes, but omitting uh, the, the magic. After that, we are checking what we've written here against the cryptographic hash that is also uh, given with uh, the new firmware. And if the cryptographic hash matches, so nothing has been changed, and that's the state that has uh, left the developer's machine. We call the finish function for the write boot flash write helper, which restores the magic and then we reboot and we uh, we jump to the bootloader and the bootloader will select slot one and slot one is booted. Uh, so basically that's how a very minimalistic update works. Let's check against our requirements. Um, this transaction is atomic because we are first erasing the magic and uh, restoring the magic is the very last step. We are ensuring integrity by checking against the cryptographic hash, but this hash must be transferred with, uh, securely. So the hash is calculated at the developer's machine, but on the way from the developer's machine to the IoT device, someone could alter this hash. So we wouldn't chain, uh, we wouldn't not, uh, um, see if, if the firmware image has been manipulated. Also, the purpose is more or less ensured. So we are checking if we are writing a riot boot image and not a picture of kittens, but we can't be sure if the image that we've or, uh, that we've just written uh, is actually comp uh, compiled for the device we are currently updating. A replay is prevented because the bootloader always starts the image with the highest version. So to fix those yeah, problems here in terms of security, uh, there is um, um, suit inside of Riot, so it's software updates for the Internet of Things. And basically the system looks like this. You have a developer who creates firmwares. We have a server that distributes firmwares and we have an IoT device. And the developer holds a private key and the IoT device holds the corresponding public key. And what the developer now does, it first compiles uh, both binaries, so binary for, for slot zero and for slot one, and then creates a manifest file. And this manifest file holds meta information about those firmware files. It holds the version number and it holds uh, the URLs to both components and the, the cryptographic hash. And all this information is signed by the private key and can be checked by the public key. Uh, a very unique feature of this asymmetric uh, keys is that the public key can't be used to create signatures. It can be just used to check signatures. And so if the signature is, is valid, we can be sure that the manifest hasn't been changed uh, since the developer signed it. Um, again, our list, um, the transaction is still atomic. The integrity is ensured because we are using asymmetry keys and digital signatures here. Uh, the purpose is also ensured because the manifest defines if the, for which device uh, this, this update is intended for and we replays are also prevented. So if you have not to deal with uh, low data rates also, um, 
check if suit suits your application. It might be a very good fit to get secure updates into your uh, IoT devices. Yeah, um, optimizations for low data rate wireless networks with high density of IoT devices. Why do we need these optimizations? So um, the main reason is SUIT uses unicast core. Unicast means there's one sender and one receiver. And so every device downloads updates individually. If you assume you have a um, sub gigahertz wireless network here, a typical data rate is 200 kilobit per second, and you're forced to send only 1% of the time. This is the duty cycle. So the data rate can be used only 1% of the time. This gives us, gives, gives us an effective data rate of just two kilobit per second. That's not very much. Um, and furthermore, we have a protocol overhead due to co-op, six low pan, and this IEEE 802.15.4, and so on and so forth. It's around about 25%. And if you want to um, yeah, put the update with the following uh, properties on the IoT devices, so the update has uh, 128 kilobytes of dice, so it's one megabit in size. And if you add up the protocol overhead of 25%, you're ending up with 1.25 megabit that needs to be transferred during the update process. And we can take those numbers and calculate the time that needs to transmit one update and it's around about 10 minutes so it's doable still a long time but it's doable and but the problem with this setup is if you want to update all 24 devices around this gateway you will end up with an update time of 4.17 hours if everything works perfectly so absolutely no time is lost anywhere and that's that's a pretty long time. Um, how can we optimize this? So first of all, sync all devices here to be awake at the same time and listen to, to network traffic at the same time. Then transfer the update once using multicast. Multicast means one sender, many recipients. And if during the multicast phase, chunks of data gets lost, which will happen because we are dealing with, with a wireless network here. Um, devices can request missing chunks uh, after the multicast phase using unicast. So this pattern can, up, uh, can um, reduce the update time uh, drastically because in, in the optimal case, we are just spending this 10 minutes to update all 24 devices. Um, we can do even better. Oops. Um, we can introduce some redundant, redundancy uh, to reduce um, the likelihood of retransmission. So here we have three blocks, uh, ASCII H, ASCII E, and ASCII Y. And if you XOR all three blocks together, you end up with 54 hex. And if you're in transmission, you're losing, for, for instance, the E, you can swap the missing E with uh, this hex 54 and do the XOR calculation again, and you're getting the E back. So one block can be restored if or the, if only one block of the four blocks is missing, it can be reconstructed using the XOR operation. Um, here's an example how this is implemented. We have a source that wants to send Hello Riot to, to a sync. And first of all, we split this into parts of three. So we are having Hello Riot here in the rows. 
And for each row, we now calculate the XOR, like shown in the last slide. And then we are not sending row-wise, we are sending column-wise over the channel, so the wireless channel, so H, L, I, E, O, O, and so on and so forth. And if on the wireless channel, we are now using three blocks in a row, uh, the following will happen. Uh, the sync receives uh, all the blocks that hasn't been destroyed uh, during transmission, brings it back into this matrix. And here you can see the empty spots that we are missing here. But as I've shown in the last slide, if only one block is missing per row, we can reconstruct it. And so we can get hello right back, even though we have missed, uh, we have lost three blocks here. Um, this concept is called interleaving. And interleaving converts burst errors, so errors in a row to random errors, so random spots in this matrix. And thus we can improve XOR erasure coding even more. Um, the current state of multicast updates in Riot. Uh, we have already put this into production for customer, um, but we haven't implemented it using the suit integration because the customer already had a safe channel to transfer those hashes. So we didn't require to, uh, the integration into suit. And I'm going to release example code during the next day. So if you're interested into this multicast pattern, uh, feel free and have a look into the code. Um, next optimization, this time it's not for low data rates, um, but this time's for very low data rate wireless networks like Doravan. Frank already teased that this is a huge challenge. Um, again, why do we need optimization? If we have the LoRa network, the Things network, we have to um, stick to their fair use policy. That means that we can ho have only 10 messages from the cloud to the sensor. So sensor to cloud, it can be much more, but the downlink messages are limited to 10 messages per day and every message can hold up to 200 bytes. I've already include, uh, excluded overhead due to the low run Mac and so on and so forth. And this gives us an effective data rate of just 200 bytes per day. And if we want to update a device with a 128 kilobyte update, it will take up to 64 days to transmit this over the things network. So you see optimization is really required in this case. So in this case, we are not adding redundancy, we, we are removing it. Um, here I'm having the GNRC LoRaWAN example that I have slightly uh, modified. I took the hello world message at the very beginning of the program and uh, yeah, change the string here and, re and then recompiled the example that leads to two binaries, the old binary and the new binary, both have the same size. And if I would transmit all those uh, 55 kilobytes over lower one, yeah, that will take uh, several days as well. But if we decompile both binaries and diff the decompiled assembler code, we see that only 22 uh, bytes in, in, in the assembly are actually changed and nothing more. So how about not transferring the whole, up, uh, the whole file, but the changes that have to be applied because uh, the device already have this A version in. And here comes a standard into play, the VC diff standard that can create binary diffs. So you have a tool uh, this, which can create those diffs. So we are calling VC diff encode. As a dictionary, they call it dictionary. 
we are calling the uh, we are providing the version that's already in the sensor and as target we are stating the version of the binary that we want to update to and we get out uh, this this diff and if we look into our folder we see both binaries and this diff and if you compare sizes here it looks doable because from 55 kilobytes, we reduce the size of just 53 bytes. So how do we apply this diff? So here's another command line tool that implements uh, the, the algorithm that would happen on, on the sensor. So we are providing uh, the currently installed um, um, image. So it's currently running this image and a, the binary diff file, which is just this 53 bytes. And we get out the new uh, version GNRC lower B, lower one B image. And if we look into the instruction log, we can see what's happening here. First of all, 44 case of uh, the old version are copied. Then we add 22 bytes. Remember, the diff showed us that we have 22 bytes and change. And then we are copying over the last 10K of bytes uh, from A to B. Let's ask MD5Sun if something went wrong. And it looks great because uh, the MD5Suns are both the same. This was our compiled uh, image. And this was the reconstructed image. So if you're interested, the encoding and decoding tools are available on GitHub. So more use cases. I've already demonstrated what ha what's happening when we are changing a constant value. And we are ending up with a diff size of 53 bytes and the download time is more or less instant. Um, when we change a small code section, uh, which could be like fixing a bug, we are getting a diff of 2.8K, which is still a good compression compared to, to the binary diff size. And it the download would just take just 1.4 days, but it's still better than 64 days. I think you agree. If we want to update Ryan from 2021.04 to 2021.07, we are getting a diff of 17K. So it will take up to a week to download this image on a lower barn sensor. So this is still not fast, but uh, over the air updates become uh, achievable. The current state of binary diff based updates so we are utilizing vcdiff in non-write environments so we are updating linux file system images and we are achieving compression ratios better than 99.5 percent which is pretty good um if you so such an image has a size of around about 250 megabytes and if you are just transferring one megabyte to update this large image that's that's a huge achievement. Um, the decoder implementation is compatible with the Riot package system. So a PR bringing the decoder to Riot is already prepared. So stay tuned, I'll release it soon. And so all in all, that's a novel approach with still a lot to be discovered. So we have to think around and try what's possible and uh, what's not. So your takeaways, Riot Boot is a great foundation for implementing uh, over the air updates. Suit might be a good fit if the network bandwidth is plentiful. Multicast updates reduce over the air update duration in high density environments. And VCDIF can be the door opener for over the air updates over LoRaWAN. Thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you, Jürgen. Um, 
We are a bit short on time, but I think we can still take one or two questions. Um, Cenk, you've already posted something on the chat. Um, care to just unmute yourself? Kristen, you're super, super... Uh, Sorry, uh, um, Cenk, um, you had a question. Yeah. Can you just un unmute yourself? Yeah. We have, so, have a few minutes left. Yeah, so do you hear me? I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, a lot of, of questions. <laughs> we heard you. We don't hear you now. He muted himself rather than unmuted himself. Can you hear me? Yes. So what about now? Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, my, my, my first question was, um, so you said uh, you're going to use multicast delivery to, to, to distribute the images. Yeah. But that's... I mean, that uh, complicates the use of um, transport security, like DTLS, for example. Are you imagining something like OSCOR to protect the the yeah, the, the transfer? Um, no, we are protecting the files that are transferred. So, so the transfer itself is unencrypted, but the file that we are um, uh, transmitting is AES encrypted. But in some application, that's okay if it's not encrypted because of um, of those cryptographic hashes ensuring that nothing has been changed. So if you don't have to hide anything, you could go with clear text multicast updates here. Okay, yeah, that's true. I mean, I think Oscar would give you some privacy. Uh, um, yeah, some privacy. Um, Thanks, but uh, yeah, if you do need this for the application, then. So the second, yeah, was more like a remark. I played around with VC diff and BS diff, and uh, yeah, I concluded that if you change the binary like moderately, for example, you have a new module or something in write, then the binary or the diff gets really big. Yeah, that's right. So um, the use case is more you have a vulnerability here and want to get rid out of this, and this can be done in. So most vulnerabilities can be fixed with just one or two lines of code. And that's maybe more the use case. Okay, thanks. Carsten? Um, Carsten Bormann was asking, um, do you still have the old image available when doing the upgrade? Might be hard to flash incrementally. Um, yes, so in uh, in the multicast scenario, we first had a bare a riot boot, so with the A and B slot, and we are programming in the non-active slot and also incremental. So we are not using this put bytes function. We are writing to flash raw here. That could be improved. But so we can we can write the byte chunks uh, randomly into the flash. So requesting unicast works here as well. If this was the question. <laughs> well, my question was that uh, when when you do VC diff, you need to have the old image available because the VC diff has these add and copy operations yeah, right. and so on. Right, because you get that. Because you're running on this image, this can't be overwritten. So you're you're taking the image you're currently running on as the source for for the VC diff algorithm. But the, the other one you are flashing is going to be at a different address. Uh, right, right. Um, we are flashing to the B slot, but then copy over to the A slot, because. Ah. Um, so we the ad addresses aren't messed up. So this copying process is in the bootloader. So the system is much more complicated here than the raw riot boot. But with this, we just have slot zero and use slot one just a temporary store for new images. So That's you don't different. have a safety image? We don't have a safety image. Thank you. I think that answers Daniel's question as well. Um, Emmanuel's question was, I think, already answered about the integrity of the complete image, um, because suit includes a hash final image. 
So if there's no more questions that come up, um, I'd say thank you, very, uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Thank and you for that... the possibility. <laughs> and I'll be around if you have further questions, I'm happy to, ask, uh, to answer them. Great. Um, so let's go over to the next presentation. Um, when I talked about um, uh, security